Hey, Pamela. Hello. Oh, I want the audio come up from another location. <laughs> there, that's better. Okay. Now we'll get any echo, 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 echo. Hey, this is Astronomy Cast. I'm Fraser Kane. That's Dr. Pamela Gay. You get to watch us make this show. And potentially have an allergy attack. I just want to warn everyone watching. Today is one of those days where I was trying to figure out who was wearing so much perfume that I could wear them and wear them, that I could smell them in the second story of my house. And I realized, no, that's the lilac tree I planted. And so no makeup, runny eyes, potential sneezing fits. This is this is what you will experience this hour along with me. Yeah. So we have to apologize to Preston for the hysterical sneezing fits that may happen. Uh, hey, I'm going to say hi to everybody. I'm going to say hi to Nancy Graziano and James Oliver and Tom Nathy and Tony Lynch and Guido Bibra um, and Peter Waldman. So far. Hello. Hi, all of you. Hello A to all of you. soggy day in Oregon. We're sorry. And apologize for uh, shifting today, but uh, Pamela had some kind of monumental grant work to be done. So as is her life. Yes. And we recovered. Well, I hope you all you all enjoyed the uh, the sort of special episode with uh, Morgan Renberg, and uh, it's, uh, and now we're back on track. And so, just a just a reminder: we take hiatus at the end of June, beginning of July. So I'm not sure what the last show will be, but we'll let you know, and that'll be for both uh, Astronomy Cast and the Weekly Space Hangout because. We get to have a summer too. <laughs> and like normal, our first episode back will probably be from Dragon Con, although I may sneak into some feed into the feed some live recordings from the International Astronomical Union meeting in Sweet. Hawaii. Um, and I'm still waiting to find out if we're going to re-vote on whether or not Pluto is a planet. And this that time I'm enough of a scientist that they'll let me vote. Last time I was too early in my career. Oh really? Yeah. How we how will you vote? Uh, usually they actually have you just hold your hand up. It's kind no, of no, no. I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't want to know the way that you will vote. I want to know if Pluto planet or not planet. Where do you stand on this? It it totally depends on on how it is worded. If it's Pluto is a planet because we want Pluto to be a planet, damn it. Then I'm going to say no. If it's all objects that have a differentiated. Uh, geophysical structure and meet certain physical criteria that would include Pluto and Ceres as being planets. I'm good with that. So if you just like remove the cleared the path from the orbit, you'd be cool with that. Um and it, there I mean it does need some geophysics added to the definition. Right, right. So oh beyond just hydrostatic equilibrium? Yeah. I mean okay. it, so hydrostatic equilibrium is good, but um yeah, it just seems like things like Vesta that that often you hear the team scientists sort of winking and nodding and calling a planet. Um, it's not entirely in hydrostatic equilibrium, but it's highly differentiated in, in, in some respects, it seems. So we need science. All right. Well, you keep us posted on, on what happens. I will. Uh, where's this year's IEU meeting? Honolulu. Oh, <laughs> but in summer, it's not as nice as going there in the... In the winter time but still it's pretty nice all yeah. year long okay let us begin with this thing we call astronomy cast now just a reminder you're going to watch a live episode of astronomy cast okay. go ahead and post any questions that you might have uh in, using the q a app so wherever you're watching this just click the link that you see in front of you and then you'll get another interface but it'll let you post some questions and we'd love to take them uh after the show so um right well, let My me know mouse if and when... will not go to the monitor that has, this is really weird. Hmm. We can wait. I, I don't know what's going on. Like, there we go. Okay, finally. I don't know why my mouse would not go to the other screen. Okay, hold on. I'll be ready in a moment. That was highly confusing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm running uh... two monitors and not being able to get your monitor to the correct screen is really disconcerting. Yes. This is 376? 376. The Miller-Urey experiment. Yes. Clearly, I forgot to open GarageBand. Sorry about that. No, no, please. We'll wait. I, I 
was so into the hangouts don't require anything but the hangout. No, no, they do. No. They really do. Now remember there's this show that we do that's connected yeah. to the whole thing. Right. Okay. So now I'm, I'm actually almost ready. Now I'm actually ready. I'm pressing record when you, you're ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. I pressed record. I am recording. Hi, Preston. I am also recording. Hey, Preston. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 376, The Miller Urey Experiment. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I am doing great. So a couple of things. One, I think this is sort of the first show that we've done since after the Hangout-a-thon. So, yes. so how did it go? What was the final fundraise? Uh, it's over $36,000. We're still literally waiting for some of the checks to clear. Um, but we hit our target. And while I don't know how far over 36000 we went, we did bring in the money to keep us going until uh, hopefully we hear positively on the grant I submitted yesterday, which is why we didn't record on Monday as normal and are now recording on Tuesday. Right. If we um, don't get the grant, we'll... <laughs> then hang out a thon 2016. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so, uh, but people can still contribute if they want to, right? Yes, always. Um, in, in fact, if you go to cosmoquest.org slash donate, um, we'd love to be able to start getting students back involved and all the little things that we've had to cut out post sequestration. It seems like every month one more thing goes by the wayside um, as grant after grant slowly winds down and there hasn't been new calls really since sequestration hit. Yeah. But here's to hoping that the future turns around. Um, as always, every dollar you give, we will stretch as far as possible towards doing science and science education. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, all the money just goes into science. Like, that's that's why we do it. That's what we're here for. And with your help, we can push out more science and outreach. And we really appreciate your help. Everything that you did during the Hangout-a-thon. Yes. And just all of the regular donations that come in from everybody. It's just, it's not for us. It's for the science. It's for the people who work on the projects and programs that we do. So we really appreciate your help. Okay, well, let's get rolling. So... Evolution explains how life adapts and evolves over the eons, but how did life originate? Chemists Miller and Urey put the raw chemicals of life into a solution, applied an electric charge, and created amino acids, the building blocks of life. So this is this this is this classic, right? The argument against evolution. They were like, well, you know, where did it start? Evolution doesn't account for how it began. Well, that's not evolution's job. Evolution doesn't have to do that. Evolution perfectly explains how life changes and adapts over time. But this nagging question, how did it all get started? I'm not saying it's aliens, but it's but it's aliens, right? No. Well, it could be, but it doesn't have to have been. Haven't you seen Prometheus? Come on. Well, yeah, but that that's the whole, we, we can't scientifically say it was aliens. We can't scientifically say it was an aliens. And you and I have done entire episodes on the idea that life on earth actually originated from bits of biome from somewhere else that ended up here but that life still had to have originated somewhere so it is a scientifically interesting question to try and figure out on whatever world or worlds plural that life originated how the heck did it originate so if you roll evolution back i mean there's a lot of uh, uh, sort of similarities between this and the big bang right that, that they're both these these branching, evolving, evolving situations, you know, but you can run the thing backwards and see things converge and see things come together. How far does evolution get us back? Um, evolution gets us to the point of having a membrane that surrounds a uh, fluid that is capable of consuming energy either uh, by transforming light or uh, through other chemical processes, you need a chemical gra gradient in order for this to happen. So basically it gets us to the point of having a membrane and a few organelles that also are capable of taking that membrane and organelles and splitting it in half to make more membranes and organelles. So 
like DNA with a few rudimentary systems yeah. working with the DNA. Yeah, you need some proteins basically that that cause things to happen that release energy. And we can trace life back pretty far. I'm like what, like almost three, what, three and a half billion years? Like Right. It it basically the very first things that you might start to consider life were forming at the point where the moon was still active with volcanism, which I find it amazing to think about. Just admittedly, this life had no real sensory perception, couldn't see the volcanism on the moon, but it's just cool to have those two pieces of science simultaneous. And pretty much as early as life could form on the earth, it did. The moment yes. Life, the Earth had cooled down. That the that the major killing volcanism, the pounding of asteroids, had settled down. Life appeared, and we were still a massively volcanic world. We just weren't a molten world anymore. So we were at the point where we were starting to have mostly solid land, mostly uh, oceans in place, but not incoming in the form of asteroids and or comets. Um, so the world was starting to look like something that you might see as a habitable world. And so something, some event, some um, aliens, um, no, something <laughs> took, you know, got this, got to the situation, right? Was, was able to, to, something happened that allowed that, that first DNA to start self-replicating. And once you've got that happening, then you're off to the races and evolution can take over and it all makes perfect sense. Uh, but it's that, it's that step, that first step. So, you know, let's sort of go down the path that Miller and Yure tried to go to try and figure this out. So, so first of all, this is another one of those cases where one of the two names is a graduate student doing most of the work and the other one is the mentor who made sure that the graduate student didn't screw up. To which one was like. which? Uri was the mentor. Miller was the scientist who did the majority of the work as graduate students do. And the key thing here is Mel Miller kept doing the work throughout his career. So Miller worked with Uri. Both of their names went on the original experiment. Miller was the keeper of the experiment and the person who continued the work all the way up into the 2000s. Well, he personally really stopped in 1999 when he passed on the work to his former graduate student. But um, it, it's really here, Miller, that you need to be thinking about. And so I guess what was the, what were they trying to do? So at this point in history, um, and it, it's important to know, this was an experiment that took place long, long, long ago in a set of understandings that um, wasn't entirely uh, what we have today. Like so, it was back in the 50s, right? Yeah, 1953 was when the experiment that everyone talks about took place. So back in the 50s, it was thought, not entirely correctly, that the early Earth's atmosphere was a place rich in lots of chemicals um, that, that are readily um, made into amino acids, although we didn't quite know that at the time. So it was thought that um, there was high humidity. It was thought that there was lots of methane, that there was lots of ammonia, that there was uh, lots of molecular hydrogen, uh, maybe some sulfides in there. Um, so in preparing to do what has become known as the Miller-Urey experiment, they put together an experimental setup where they had one sphere that had water in the bottom, a heat source underneath the water um, outside of the sphere, so it was not contaminating it with anything. And they heated up the water to create, well, steam, humidity, that high humid tropical environment that you think of when you think of the early Earth. Um, they also, so then they had a tube that ran over to another uh, sphere. And that sphere was the place of electrical death, um, except it created life, uh, or not life, but the stuff needed for life. And so that sphere had electrodes coming into it, and they zapped electricity back and forth between those electrodes, electrodes simulating 
all of the lightning that was getting triggered by the still active volcanism. There's been article after article, I know Universe Today has run several of them, about how the um, environment above an active volcano actually is exactly what you need to trigger electrical strikes, lightning strikes. Yeah, I'm sure so, people have seen a million of these pictures that you just these beautiful. Amazing. Uh, amazing, right? Where you get you get a volcano erupting and there's lightning going off throughout the the plumes. It's, yeah, it's fantastic. So, so they were trying to simulate that electrical storm. So they had electricity going off and then they're, they're basically mixing um, ammonia, hydrogen gas, uh, methane, all of these things together in this other sphere with the high humidity uh, vapor coming in. Um, and then beneath that, they had a cold trap that would allow whatever was formed to funnel down into a U-shaped trap. So they're, they're catching everything. This is a completely sealed experiment. And they had the ability to put a sampling probe in and sample fluids that came out of that trap. So uh, I guess so the point here is, is that they've got this fairly pure water flowing into this. They've got these chemicals. They've got this lightning going in. And then who knows what's going to come out of it. You're going to be zapping these chemicals. You're going to be putting water into it. It's warmed up. Zap, 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 zap. So what did they find in the trap? So, so what they found was uh, 11 out of the 20 primary amino acids uh, that we worry about when we're thinking about life here on Earth. And they knew that these weren't contaminants because when it comes to life, for whatever reason, we prefer right-handed molecules, uh, molecules that are aligned with all the bends in one way that chemists refer to as right-handed. But the atoms can actually bond using both right-handed and left-handed symmetries. And this should be a random process, which way they form. And what they actually found is the molecules formed in that random half right, half left kind of way that let them know this wasn't just some bacteria got into their experiment. Oh, I see. So if they'd found a bunch of only right-handed molecules in there, they would have known that, oh, okay, then that's what the then that came from the bacteria, but because they found that balance. I've actually heard, I'm going to completely segue for a second here. You know, some people have thought about this idea that there's a complete shadow uh, ecosystem out there that is run from those left-handed molecules and that we just, we don't interact. Now, it's probably not big creatures. They're probably just little bacteria somewhere, maybe, but that we can't see them because we just have no, we don't have any detection for them. We don't really expect to see them at all and that they might very well exist out there so. and and it's it's one of the great confusions why is it that life prefers right-handed molecules but that's sort of like why does the universe prefer what we refer to as matter instead of antimatter this is just the way things turned out and we don't know the answers yeah but, exactly but what was key here is with their experiment they found both kinds of amino acids and what was literally really cool is they took the samples, or more to the point, Miller, the graduate student, took the samples and very carefully stored it in vials, sealed it off, stored all of his lab notes, referring on the vials to the pages in the lab notes that, that corresponded with the experiments being ran, kept all of, of the samples. And back in the 1950s, it was hard to detect amino acids. They, they were actually doing this using um, chromatography, which is one of those things that probably everyone did in school at some point if they've grown up in the 80s or later. This is where you either put uh, ink on a piece of wet tissue on the edge and you see how the different shades of color in the ink separate out at different rates or uh, if you went to a, a sophisticated school you actually did this with a sample of DNA and saw how the different um, segments in the DNA split out to, to different distances along the much fancier chromatography paper. Anyways, this, this is a process by which you separate out amino acids or DNA segments, uh, chromosomes, if you will, um, and 
depending on the size of the molecule, they travel different distances in a set amount of time along the chromatography paper. So they're using basic chromatography, it may have been with a gel instead of with paper, to separate out the amino acids. This is not the most sophisticated way to do things. They found 11 amino acids doing this. Now fast forward until modern times. In the 70s, they actually went back and using modern techniques, found a few more amino acids. And then in 1999, after having a stroke, Miller passed all of his lab notes, all of his equipment, everything he had to um, his legacy child, you might say, the that student that um, continued on all of his work. Um, in, in this case, um, that student was, was still actively engaged in doing research. Um, and um, this was Jeffrey Bada, who's now in the University of California system. Um, and Jeffrey Bada reanalyzed these vials and found there were actually dozens of amino acids in there, but some of them were simply at such low levels that it wouldn't have been possible for Miller to, to find them with the technology he had in the 50s. What was particularly amusing is some of these were sulfur amino acids that um, other big names like Carl Sagan went on to discover later on, but they'd already been produced through the Miller-Urey experiment. It just was a matter that they didn't have the technology to know that they'd made this discovery. So did they, had they pretty much then produced all of the amino acids required for life? Um, I don't know if they have taken the time to analyze them enough to, to find all of them, but they've certainly found the bulk of them. But this isn't without controversy, unfortunately. Right. So, so let's explain the controversy and then sort of, and then, then talk a bit about some variants of the experiment because there was a lot of other variations which actually you know, bore a bunch more fruitful results. So yeah, so let's talk about the controversy. So, so the controversy isn't anything too big, but unfortunately it's kind of fundamental. Um, like I said at the beginning of the episode, uh, all of this work was, was based on the idea that things like hydrogen gas, methane, uh, the, the ammonia, all of these things were readily available in the atmosphere. And truth be told, uh, there's this little thing called nitrogen uh, that was in large quantities, still is. Um, and if you're you breathing had, it right now. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and had you just grabbed a random part of the Earth's atmosphere back then, uh, the chemical mixture would have been really different. And if you ran this experiment with the now we believe, thanks to better research, thanks to sampling of rocks formed at the time and things like that, um, you wouldn't have gotten these results. You still probably would have gotten a few amino acids, but not in the numbers, not in the variety that, that were described in this experiment. So they got the primitive atmosphere wrong? Yeah. Right, it was okay. the 50s. It's okay. They tried. But, but while they got the primitive atmosphere wrong, which was one of the foundational ideas behind their experiment, that atmosphere that they described um, did exist in other places on the earth. And they ran other experiments that were more correct that nobody talks about for some reason. So for instance, if you decided to, instead of being somewhere random on the planet earth with lots of lightning going on, maybe, um, this experiment wouldn't have been correct because the atmosphere was wrong. But if instead you moved over to hover near one of these volcanoes, the atmosphere right outside of a volcano did fairly closely resemble the, the atmosphere they designed. And more to the point, in later exper experiments that Miller did, he uh, simulated the pressurized uh, jets coming out of volcanoes as part of the experiment, sending those jets of material through the simulated lightning, his electrical shocks. For some reason though, whether it be frustration, exhaustion, illness, um, he never published those results, but he kept all of the samples. He kept all of his lab notes and Jeffrey Bada, after getting all of this equipment notes everything else in 99 
he went through a period of not dealing with it, but then later did get the curiosity to start going through the samples. And in the 2000s, uh, realized that in these later experiments designed to simulate the, exp the, the environment uh, around volcanoes, um, even more amino acids were produced uh, in greater varieties, more of the th more things that we don't know how they would have been involved because we don't exactly have the bacteria from back then. But um, these these later experiments were huge unpublished successes. Right. So, uh, you know, you can kind of imagine the situation around these volcanoes that it's like if you go near the place where the lightning is getting produced, you also get an atmosphere that is similar and to, to what you would need. But, but I mean, this is just one possible environment. I know that a lot of researchers had very fruitful experiments looking at like the environment around black smokers, you know, the sort of the, the vents that come out of volcanoes at the bottom of the ocean. So it's, you know, it's a different environment happening, but different kinds of things are, are possible there. So, you know, wherever you have excess of energy, you've got various chemicals coming together in interesting ways. And and just to step back a moment, when we say amino acids, what, what we're talking about aren't molecules that are particular to life. These are rather simply a molecule that includes an amine chemical group. This is an NH2 uh, component as part of the molecular structure where you have a nitrogen with at least two hydrogens attached to it. They can have more hydrogens attached to, the, to them. Um, and then uh, they also tend to have a COOH group that includes a carbon that's double bonded to one oxygen and then also bonded to an OH molecule. So when you have these two different uh, components to this giant organic molecule or occasionally smaller organic molecule, anything that has these two structures is a kind of amino acid. So there's actually dozens and dozens and dozens of amino acids that you can construct and that exist in nature. Not all of them are used in life. Some of them are probably quite deadly to human beings. Right. Um, so what they're doing when we talk about these experiments is taking simplistic molecules, ammonia, which is NH4, for instance, taking these simple molecules and providing the energy necessary, and sometimes the time scales and pressure necessary to allow these smaller building block molecules to form into larger and larger molecular structures. And, and so, I mean, I guess the big question is like, what's the gap? What's the gap from a jumble of amino acids, the building blocks of life, to something that's capable of, of you know, in some rudimentary form, replicating itself, or at least drawing those amino acids out of the environment and turning them into something that can then, you know, go another generation. Because, you know, evolution needs something to get its hooks into it, right? Right, right. And, and this is where we start looking at um, exactly what point do you start claiming something is alive. In, in the 60s, John Orna, um, did experiments that started creating the nucleotides. And there's four separate nucleotides that bond together in specific ways to form uh, DNA and RNA. Um, so by using hydrogen cyanide and ammonia and water, he was able to create in, in environments that you might find deep in the ocean, um, amine groups in large amounts uh, starting to show how you get at the ribonucleic acids and um, well all of the nucleobases that we see in humans and all other life forms so the question starts to be at what point is a molecule that will undergo continuous creation versus a cell that is specific in how those molecules are aligned where do you define the difference between a molecule and a life form? Um, the basic definitions that we work from is life form has from generation to generation a evolving through slight mutations um, structure that is as a whole consistent that processes energy and turns it in to cell walls and other cellular things. Um, 
Whereas a molecule is something that just undergoes a chemical reaction, but the cell is undergoing the chemical reactions within the cell. It gets kind of muddy. And right. So the and question, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, it's, it's a huge leap. It's a huge yeah. leap to go from a soup of, of amino acids. Even if you have those building blocks, it's, you know, it's how do you go from a pile of space Lego pieces to an X-wing TIE fighter made out of right. Lego. Right. So, and, and we haven't been able to artificially put together DNA, stick it in a cell, ma cell membrane and get the sucker to reproduce. We have to start with cell lines, um, take them apart and put them back together, but we still have to start with that cell line. We just can't create it. Right. And so, uh, e and even if we could do that, that still wouldn't necessarily figure out how they got that first assembly. But the point is, that's science. Right. So just keep looking, just keep experimenting both. And so scientists as you know, are pushing on both sides of this question, right? You've got the scientists on the one hand looking for that last common ancestor and trying to either create it or try to, you know, how simple can you make life to the point that it's able to, to do this job of replication. And that there's tremendous work going on in, on that realm. Um, was it, uh, you know, some of the some of the scientists are, are trying to create an, an artificial life form from the simplest possible connection. And then on the other side, you've got these people who are following in the footsteps of Miller Ure. Let's keep trying to see how we can make more interesting and more complicated molecules, more amino acids, collections of amino acids, as you say, nucleotides come together in ways that maybe we can get at something that's gonna be a lot more like life as we understand it. And eventually hopefully those two paths will connect like two sides of a tunnel you know being taken and, to a mountain and it's just going to require the right combination of creativity and tenacity one of the big questions we're still just trying to understand is did life originate on the surface of the earth deep in the ocean at a volcanic vent or did it just form out of the clays and rich organic compounds with thermal gradients that existed in the soils. We don't even know where life originated. Or did it fall out of the sky? Exactly. But we're going to keep looking. And uh, hopefully along the way, we'll be able to figure out how did it start and what are the chances that it started not just here, but well, maybe multiple places here and multiple places around our universe. Yeah. And as we've said on and many times, right, that the mystery is what's exciting. The fact that we don't know, the fact that there's discovery to be made, that there are experiments to do to try and get to this question, that's what makes it wonderful. And uh, it's totally fine to say, I don't know, you know, <laughs> who knows? We don't know yet. Let's figure it out. It's okay. And this is our journey of exploration. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Pamela. My pleasure. And thanks to Miller and Yuri, because that's a terrific experiment. And, and thanks to Jeffrey Bada for continuing it and his continued work uh, publishing the legacy of his graduate advisor. That's awesome. All right. We'll talk to you next week, Pamela. And save. Done. And save. Don't go anywhere. We will be answering your questions. I got through it without sneezing. It was very exciting. Do, do you need to sneeze now? No, no. Okay. I, I actually, hot salsa is the, kind of the best non-drowsy decongestant and I have partaken. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, <laughs> I'll, keep, I'll keep some of that medicine on hand. Okay. Just want to make sure that we're safe. This has got to be the most exciting part of the show. Do you love yeah, this Yeah, we're sorry, everybody. No, it's all right. I'm checking Twitters to see if anyone left us questions there. Oh, really? Okay, all right. Uh, Boom. Okay, I am uploading. Also, our Dropbox could use a cleaning at some point. Just saying. Okay. I see 20 of my episodes-ish in there. Okay. <laughs> no, no, 10. Just 10, 11. Okay. Um, let's, uh, let's see if we can find some questions here. Who's got a question? Do you, you, what about you? Um, let's 
say? It's surprisingly intense when you point directly at the camera. Uh, Leonard Lindstrom notes that a planet is either a body orbiting the sun, has collapsed under its, sphere, under its own gravity, and has been visited by a spacecraft, or a non stale object orbiting another star and has been detected from Earth. So that's that's kind of clever, right? That it's been visited by a spacecraft because that just that just draws the line in the sand and says but it's Titan. Pluto, it's Ceres, it's well, it's a body orbiting the sun. Um, so I'm yeah, so, so not not a yeah, moon. Yeah, I guess the orbiting the sun works. Yeah, yeah, so not a moon. But, but that also like makes uh, the comet Deep Space encountered rather violently uh, a planet. It makes. Mm. Yeah, but it's not. No, it has to be collapsed under a sphere. It has to have hydrostatic equilibrium. That's true. Okay, mm -hmm. this might work. I, I like still it. want more geophysics. I want more geophysics. Yeah, I but, like you, but I you want know, more geophysics. Geof but the point is, is that now we can just that if you if you want it to be a planet, send a spacecraft. <laughs> you know, stop whining about it until you've sent that spacecraft and it's been explored. Then it can get. Then it gets to be a planet. I think that's. I think that's a great one, Leonard. I am on board. You have my vote. Um, because they're just going to be like, especially anything new that we're going to find. They're going to be small, just little dots, and we're just going to have to use our imagination. So, this will encourage people to send spacecraft. I. I think it's great. Um, on that though, Steve Chisnell asks: Is is Sharon a satellite of Pluto, or are Pluto and Sharon collectively a double dwarf planet? What difference a double, double planet dwarf. The, or double yeah. planet? I'll go with double. either of those. Yeah. Current love definition it. of double dwarf. Yeah, I'd love it if it's we had a double, double planet. Um, Steve Chisnell says: Have we met an astrophysicist from the name of Jacob Bourgelet? I'm no. horrible with names. <laughs> you I sure don't think are. so. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> yeah, anyone who knows me well knows names are not something I'm good with. Works at the University of Michigan. Nope. Maybe Theoretical when physicist I was a at the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen. Okay. All right. There you go. Um. Adam Synergy says, did life first arise on comet or did, did it did, did it arise on Earth or did it arrive on a comet or asteroid? And it was no definitive evidence, but what's your gut feeling? Uh, well, for starters, our guts are worthless. Never trust yes. your gut. Your gut is will only steer you wrong. But if you had to choose... My gut is indifferent and thinks it probably arrived both places. Okay, so here's my gut. My gut is that it came from space. And here's why. Because the well it's not a great actually it's not great either um i think i'm gonna have to go with you the, the the part that's the kicker right is that as soon as life could arise it did that's the part that's weird and freaks me out see i'm all about the multiple origins of of when life can start to arise it does which means that it could easily have arisen somewhere else that was a little bit more habitable early on, like Mars, and then gotten here as that world got deadly. But but the thing is, is that that collides in my brain with the Fermi paradox, right? Which is like if life could arise as soon as possible, if the if the galaxy is swarming with molecules for life, if solar system is swarming with molecules for life. And why this hasn't it arisen in all these different places, right? Well, and this is where I really like Robert Sawyer's idea that once life societies reach a certain level of sophistication, in in order to achieve immortality, they basically encapsulate themselves into artificial environments, cyber structures. Um, therefore, there's a very limited window through which life still explores the galaxy before deciding, nope, I want to have immortality. I'm going to sure. become a computer. Hey, I, I totally want to become a computer, but we would still see the, that would still require energy and resources, right? So, so that's all. Like if, God like if we, numbers by Robert Sawyer, it's a really interesting. Sure. Movie. I'll totally read it. The, but it's like, if life took, have, you know, if, if we had like 4 billion years on Earth where there was no life, even though there could have been life, and then there was life for the last 500 million years, then that feels random to me, right? It just feels like, 
you know, we're the only planet in the in the galaxy that life formed on it and took a long time and we just, you know, we were lucky. We were the place on the dartboard that got hit. But because it formed immediately after the time when it was possible, that just makes it so weird. So, um, And this is where I think it's just really easy to create primordial life and really hard to get to intelligence at our level of technological sophistication without killing yourself. You know, imagine yeah. if, if if just the recent Ebola plague had run more like a, a, a one of the virus games that, that you can download. There's plague apps that you can play on your phone where you wipe out the planet in a couple of years. All of the zombie movies we've watched. Um, World War Z is not too hard a thing to think about. So I'm not pro zombie apocalypse. I'm yeah, just come saying, on. I'm just saying that that intelligent life is really easy to destroy, okay. and small yeah. life easy. Let, let, speaking of the Walking Dead and all these zombies, allow me to pose a puzzler for you, which is that when you watch the Walking Dead and there's all these big masses of zombies, well, a zombie movie and there's all these zombies roaming around. How did they get turned into zombies? Because whenever you see zombies attack a person who's not a zombie, they you know they gobble them up and and uh, you know so. Watch I don't World War Z. It's more internally consistent. No, those zombies tear people apart. So how do they all become zombies in the first place? You see? They don't tear them apart. They infect them. Yeah, but, but with their clawing at them. So anyway, all I'm saying is, why do all the zombies that currently exist look so clean and have all their body parts intact because they would have been infected by other zombies? It's weird to me. So, um, you're just reading the wrong zombie stuff. Uh, Mer Lafferty handles this actually really, really well in her Shambling Guide to New York City. And, um, oh, what's another good one? I inadvertently went on a zombie book reading spiel last summer. Anything um, by Scott, right? Well, yeah, there's Scott's, Scott Sigler's books, but those are less zombie and more plague. Um, anyways, Mer, Mer Lafferty's way of dealing with it is actually really good. Um, the, yeah, um, I read an entire series recently where the premise was the bloggers are like the only real news source and they're the ones going out and poking zombies, <laughs> literally poking zombies and reporting on it. I can't remember the name of it, but it was pretty good. And uh, um, so James Haney on uh, on Google Plus says, "Zap, zap, zap! This techno babble is going to blow my mind." <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we can't make this show without injecting some of the scientific terminology used Sorry. by the scientists. So that's just part of it. And I hope you know we'll try not to have too much of the techno babble into the show. But you know, sometimes we're going to have to do that. I, I techno babble occasionally, and I haven't slept very much lately, so. No, no. Uh, he's just saying the word zap. Oh, okay. Yeah, we also use that scientifically. Zap is yeah. a thing. You do yeah. zap things, including yourself if you're not careful. Yeah. Sandy likes to zap asteroids with a, with radar. Feed. That's the name of the series I ran. Feed by Mira Grant is a perfectly reasonable zombie book series. Um, oh, Sylvan really Westby know. asks, is it possible that abiogenesis is one of the questions that have many plausible answers and we will never know which one was the one that actually happened? Yes. yes. And in fact, what we won't know if it was multiple answers that ended up later breedings, just sort of like human beings contain both uh, Devonian and Nathandro Nathandri Nathan no. what we're talking about? Nathandri the the high brow ridge prehumans I can't say the word Neanderthal yes just like yeah. we so we have Neanderthal Devonian. and Homo De it's Devonian okay um, right so somehow there was like some kind of breeding between the two lines depending that depending on where on the planet you were yeah theoretically um, not okay. theoretically DNA does not lie. Um, well, how it came together, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, Guido Bieber asks, I think it might be time for an astronomy cast science fiction reading list, Pamela and Fraser. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, we we talk about it. We we did that quite a bit. Uh, we did an Arthur C. Clarke episode. Um, what have I read recently? The Martian. That obviously. is really good. 
Um, I hate to admit it. I've been reading Lovecraft lately so that I don't get sucked in because Lovecraft is is good, but not so good that you feel no desire to put it down and walk away. I've been kind of doing some older stuff. I did um, Werner Vinge, uh, Fire Upon the Deep. I did Slaughterhouse Five recently, sort of. I uh, did uh, Hitchhiker's oh, Guide to the Galaxy with the yeah. kids. Um, I've been reading newer stuff lately. I did Elantris by Br Brandon Sanderson, who took on the legacy of um, Robert Jordan's Legacy of Time. Um, I did, oh, 2312 by Kim Stanley Robinson is an intriguing hmm. intriguing book. Um, it's, it's not as good as The Red Mars, but it will leave you really thinking hard. Um, Origin by J.J. Koneth. Do you have like a list? Yeah, I need to good read all of this. That's cool. Um, and if you're looking for easy YA to read with your kids or something to read when you're really sick or just because you don't want to read something complicated, um, the Cinder Scarlet Crest Charming series, uh, not Charming, uh, Cinder Scarlet Crest series by Marissa Mayer is actually really good and an intriguing take on the old uh fairy tales uh tom nathy says having life coming in from elsewhere still doesn't explain how life started well that's exactly right so so like unless we can actually see you know if unless people can create some experiment that similar to the miller yuri experiment where it really gets the process almost all the way to life you're going to be left with these questions. Like, unless it's just super obvious that that's the way that it happened, you're constantly just going to be asked, well, where did that come from? Where did that come from? So, yeah, and that's okay. We don't have to know. Um, let's see what else we got. Cecil Morgan asked a question, and I'm not really sure what he's talking about here. So any new info on the sealed experiments from the 1950s that they yes. found in the lab in 2008? I know exactly what he's talking about. So the sealed experiments were maintained at minus 108 degrees Fahrenheit. This is where he took a bunch of the basic building blocks for life, froze them uh, in water uh, under fairly high pressure, and waited to see um what would happen and very very slowly 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 and here we're looking at situations similar to what you might find in a comet um all of the organic molecules have been forming i don't know of any published results since 2008 but uh yeah that that's one of my favorite experiments and there's actually a radio lab episode about it that you can look up Oh, cool. Okay. Um, okay, I think that's all of those questions there. Did anything come through on Twitter? Nope. Just friendly humans. Uh, James Haney is suggesting The Light of Other Days by Arthur C. Clarke and Stephen Baxter. Cool. Which deals with micro wormholes and the ability to look back in time and the implications for humanity. So, cool. Man, I'm wanting to... I, I think we should take a break this summer and spend some time and catch up on all our reading. Exactly. So, uh, awesome. Well, let's uh, let's wrap things up. Oh, Steve Chisnell recommends uh, Neon Genesis Evangelion as a uh, as something that's sort of in line with Panspermia and Arthur C. Clarke. Yeah, boy, that's quite a show. Have you ever seen ever seen that anime? No, I'll have to watch it. Is is it one that's subtitled or dubbed? Subtitled. Yeah, there's probably a dub version out there as well. I mean, it's there's a few of like the best anime. Uh, Cowboy Bebop is fantastic. If you've never seen it, I highly recommend it. Um, and Neon Genesis, Neon Genesis Evangelion. I'm not sure the exact way to say it, but it's uh, yeah, it's a head scratcher of a show. It starts out a little not sort of it kind of takes a little while to get rolling, and then the later parts of it are just way out there um but it's a good it's a good show cool. also attack on titan which i was actually watching the trailer that was to good. yeah attack on titan before uh before we started the show um what else have we been watching that's about it so um okay cool well let's wrap this up so hey pamela thank you so much as always really appreciate it 
Um, sure. I, I think people should, if they're not already doing it, they should follow you on Twitter. So go to Star Strider with a Y on Twitter and follow Pamela. And while you're at it, follow me. You F. know, Kane. F. Kane. Super easy. All right. Well, hey, thanks, Pamela. Thanks, everybody, for watching. And we will see you all on Friday for the Weekly Space Hangout or next Monday for our next episode of Astronomy Cast. Sounds good, Fraser. And thank you. See you later.